Hi, I am Nick Penniman. I am the founder and CEO of Issue One, and we are very happy today to be uh, hosting the authors and the publisher of The Steel, which you will hear a lot more about in a second. Um, but before you do, I just want to I just want to explain why um, we at Issue One are doing this. For many of you who who know us, know that we were deeply involved in preventing the steal in uh, 2020 and then in January of, of 2021 with our counter revote campaign. As a component of that, came we, of that campaign, we formed something called the National Council on Election Integrity, which is alive and well today. It has 40 members, half Republican, half Democrats. Six of them are former cabinet secretaries, four former generals and admirals. Names that you know, like uh, Tom Daschle and Madeleine Albright, Dan Coates, who worked for Trump, Donald Trump, um, and many, many others. Uh, we are we at Issue One will be extending our counter revote campaign all the way through January of 2025, in part because of what you're about to hear, and in part, of course, because what you've been reading in the media, which is this: that the Stop the Steal crowd is uh, is a part of probably the most vibrant and powerful political movement occurring in America right now. It's perhaps the most vibrant political movement since uh, since we saw in 2010 with the Tea Party movement, and before that, probably the election of, of President Obama. Um, it is a movement that is well-funded. It has its own leadership structure with Steve Bannon and others. It has its own story and narrative, its own media, um, and it has its targets. They are running for election administration positions from the county level all the way up to the Secretary of State. They are running for governor. They are fielding candidates for the House and the Senate. And as we know, there are current members of the House and the Senate who are already kind of embedded in the movement or, or pretty well manipulated by the movement. So, uh, you know, we are hosting this book talk because we think that this was not a one-off event. This is, the, the, these authors have written about kind of the first wave of what is a powerful, um, authoritarian movement in this country that needs to be taken very seriously and is growing. Uh, so, you know, in addition to what you hear in the book and what you've read, we just, of course, learned that, um, that Trump said that he would have pardoned the January 6 uh, insurrectionists. There was an op-ed about a month ago by three generals, former generals in the military, who said that they're worried about insurrection or potential coup attempts in January of 2025. So we need to, we need to also recognize that, um, that this movement and the threat to our country is pervasive and has even been kind of seeping its way into the ranks of the military in, in addition to the ranks of state houses and Congress. Um, so with that, I will, I will turn it over to Morgan Entrekin right now. Morgan is the president and publisher of Grove Atlantic. Um, and Morgan, I know that you essentially commissioned this book, right? You reached out to these authors because you, after you, you had been kind of steeped in a lot of this stuff for a while and felt like this book had to be, had to be published. So tell us more about why you did well, it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I am the publisher of it at, at, at Grove Atlantic, which is um, one of the last of the sort of mid-sized independent publishing companies. It consists of Atlantic Monthly Press, founded in 1917 out of the magazine, and Grove Press, founded in 1947. Um, we, my partners and I combined them in, in 93. We publish about 100 books a year, politics, history, biography, drama, poetry, literature, et cetera. And I've published a number of important groundbreaking books over the 100 odd years of, 120 years of its existence. But, um, and, and, you know, I feel like this book is one of the most important books that I've ever published in my in my career. I've been doing this. This is my 46th year. Um, and uh, this is an unusual book for us in that book publishers don't usually commission books about current events or book events that are unfolding. That's used. That's more uh, 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 magazine work, although that magazine work has been diminishing in the last few years. But what triggered this was watching um, the election unfold and the aftermath of the election, November 3rd, week, next weeks, next weeks, next weeks. And that, that you know, I think w w with, with the final um, uh, determination that, that Biden had won, I think it was by November 9th, um, then each subsequent event uh, as through December and January, um, 
but culminating on January 6th of that terrible uh, uh, insurrection, um, I, I was one dismayed that uh, there seemed to be just this counterfactual narrative going forward that that very prominent Republicans uh, and and office holders and just leaders were unwilling to uh, push back on. Um, and I think for the first time in American history, we had a president who would not concede an election and who would not uh, recognize that these were the results of a free and fair election. So. Um, what really triggered it was an essay that David Remnick wrote, the editor of The New Yorker, uh, on the day of the uh, Trump's second acquittal. And he said, he made the remark, there will be a record. The history will show there will be a record. So I kind of waited around for a few weeks and I thought, okay, well, who's going to create that record? And I thought, I can't see anybody doing it, so why don't I do it? And what I was intent on doing, I reached out. The first person I reached out to was a conservative writer, an old friend of mine, P.J. O'Rourke, because I knew that this record, if we were going to create it, needed reporters and researchers from both sides of this political spectrum. One, so that we could get both sides to talk to us, and two, so we would know what to report, and three, so that it would be perceived as, as objective. So. Um, that's how it came about. That's what triggered me. We were introduced to Matt Teague. Uh, Matt's a terrific investigative journalist who's worked for National Geographic and The Atlantic and The New York Times. He's been a Neiman Fellow at Harvard. Um, it was, it was, he was a wonderful addition. And then M Mark Bowden, who is, I've worked with for more than 20 years. We first did Black Hawk Down together and we've published every subsequent book, um, is a, a reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer for years. And when I told Mark, I actually reached out to Mark to see if we could find some more young people to research and, and report with this, a creative of this team. And Mark said, well, what about if I get involved? And I thought, well, that'll be fantastic. So um, I think this team did an, an amazing job of reporting. I used and stole the structure from Jim Dwyer's brilliant, Jim Dwyer and Kevin Flynn's great book about the 9-11 uh, uh, called 102 Minutes. We focus on 64 days, November 3rd to midday, January 6th at one in the afternoon. And, um, uh, you know, I, as I was saying, right, when we were in the green room here, if you had told me a year ago that we could get this book out on this schedule at this quality and get this response for it, uh, I, I would have been thrilled. The book is, is superb. It will serve as a record. It has appendices with every uh, congressperson and senator who voted not to certify. We had a researcher create a list of all the court cases and the outcome. Um, and uh, we'll do an afterword that will bring up bring it more up to date with some of what's coming out from the Jan 6 committee. But um, I think one of the key things here is to uh, to show people. And you know what I kiddingly said, I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, and I uh, I have family members and friends who buy into this this false narrative. And um, I was kiddingly said to some of well, here's, here's a book for those family member and friends who maybe believe some of this baloney. And so one thing is, it's a great read. So with that, I will turn it over to Mark and Matt, who will tell you a little bit about what they have done and, and uh, what the book is. It is a great read. Let me just interject that. And, and we have, um, thanks to Morgan, we have shipped this out to, I believe, about a thousand of our supporters at issue one. So some of you on this call might have already received it. If not, you probably will soon. Uh, by the way, the, it's been incredibly well reviewed. The Washington Post called it, quote, a marvel of reporting, and I can attest to that. You can see all the dog-eared pages there uh, that I, I just couldn't sleep while reading it. So, so um, uh, Matt and Mark, take it away. Well, go ahead, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think what we wanted to do um, was to find the source of of, of what happened on January 6th. We knew there would be a lot of reporting and writing about the events of that day, um, but we really wanted to address why. Why did we get there as a country? Um, and that started around the country, not in Washington, DC. Uh, elections are not um, held in a central federal building that a guy you know, in a horn helmet with a spear can run into and overthrow. They're really held in the counties and towns and uh, uh, villages across the country. Um, so that's the story that we wanted to tell, was the story of the pressure that uh, largely Republican officials came under uh, in those places. Many of them even were Trump supporters, um, but they refused to buckle um, to the, the pressure to lie that was coming from the Trump campaign. And so we wanted to tell their story. 
Yeah, I, I agree with Matt. I think that the um, two things, one was we felt from the beginning that the events on January 6th, as dramatic and tragic as they were, uh, were number one, going to be very thoroughly investigated and reported on, and we're seeing that happen. Um, but I also felt that that was the wrong place to look um, for what really went on, because you know, I, I, I view the January 6th episode as a kind of temper tantrum at the end of a long and unsuccessful effort to overturn the election. And that effort unfolded in the six swing states, um, trying to convince uh, election officials to falsify the election results, trying to convince state legislators to refuse and election people to refuse to um, certify the election results. And, and of course, in the courts, attempting to get judges to intervene to throw out um, the actual election results. So even though, you know, before we started looking on it, we didn't know exactly what we were gonna find, but we did find a very concerted, if somewhat um, amateurish and slapdash effort. I mean, there, there was a real Donald Trump quality uh, to this effort, which was a you know horrible idea backed with no substance, um, and as and the results showed, but I think the pattern that we've documented in the steel is one that we all ought to be very concerned about because that that's how uh, you would go about changing the results of an election. Um, guys, talk about the kind of everyday hero. Uh, uh, impact, uh, you know, here, because a lot of what you report on are folks who, um, you know, who are tr Trump sympathizers, who voted for Trump, um, who even going into the election believed that perhaps it could be stolen because Trump had been tweeting since March of 2020 that it, the only way he could lose is if it was stolen. And, and not only did some of those people end up standing up to certify the vote and do the right thing, but they kind of, you know, in a way they had to do it and flip against their friends and their own communities as part of the process. So, so um, tell us more about the kind of everyday hero aspect of this. And by the way, for the audience, I think what we'll do is we'll have a conversation with Matt and Mark for a little while here, and then we'll open it up to, um, to Q&A, which I believe we're gonna do through the chat. I think when I think about the heroes uh, in the book, the person who sort of leaps to mind for me is a, a county clerk named Cheryl Guy. Um, in Antrim County, Michigan. And she uh, is in some ways a little bit of a tragic figure because there was a cost to what she did, but she stood up and told the truth. Um, she is a Trump supporter. Um, she's uh, not particularly tech savvy though, as she says. And on election night, as the, uh, the votes were coming in, her job was to sort of tabulate them. And dealing with the computer, she accidentally shifted a few thousand votes, about 3,000 from from Trump to Biden, to from one column to the other. And she realized within a few hours the mistake she had made. One of those votes was probably hers because she had voted for Trump himself. Uh, and she immediately came forward and said, I've, I've made a mistake, I've corrected it, I'm sorry, but this was just my personal error. Uh, but in that little window of time, um, it sort of rocketed around the country and even the world um, that something had gone wrong in Antrim County, Michigan. And pretty quickly, there were private jets coming in the night, people descending on her office. Uh, her life was turned upside down. Um, and there was enormous pressure on her to say that it was the machines, that it was the Dominion machines that had actually shifted votes from one side to the other. You may have heard that narrative sort of take hold a little bit uh, in the wake of the election that they were shifting votes. And she steadfastly said, no, actually, I just didn't know what I was doing. I made a mistake. I did this. Um, and people she had known her entire life, people whose birth certificate she had signed as county clerk, turned on her and said she was un-American and a traitor and even worse than that. Um, and she's not going to run for re-election again um, this next time. Um, I think in large part just because of the pain of standing up and telling the truth. And I, I found that very heroic. Yeah, we, we found a lot of them, Nick. Um, he, you know, I, what co comes to mind for me is 
Clint Hickman in Phoenix, Arizona. Clint is the, or was the chairman of the Board of Supervisors for Maricopa County, which encompasses Phoenix and the surrounding area, and which is basically 90 plus percent of the votes in the state of Arizona. And Clint was a lifelong Republican, uh, was a Trump supporter, um, and he was um, surprised on election night when Fox called Arizona for Joe Biden. Uh, Arizona had always been uh, pretty much of a Republican lock, and so that came as a surprise. But he was even more surprised about an hour later when Trump came on TV and named Maricopa County, Clint's County, as one of the centers of this rigged fraudulent election. Well, Clint ran the election uh, for Maricopa County. So he's a Republican, he's a Trump supporter, but he's also responsible for conducting the election in his county. And he had a lot of pride in the way that they went about it and also had a lot of faith uh, that they had done so honestly and, and, and effectively. So he found himself targeted by Trump personally, uh, calling him Rudy Giuliani, calling him by protesters on the front lawn of his house, calling for his arrest, uh, folks erecting a guillotine on the grounds of the Arizona State House, calling for his and the other supervisor's execution. Um, so he, he endured, you know, a, weeks of uh, this kind of abuse, but basically refused to lie. Uh, he, you know, supervised a recount of the election, which found that it was accurate as he expected it would be. Uh, but he continued to, you know, get this sort of pressure. And much to his credit, you know, he refused to uh, do anything other than certify what he knew were the actual election results. And, and to this day, I mean, he's, I've been in touch with him just in the last couple of weeks, and he's, he's really alarmed that in the state of Arizona, the Republican Party has made uh, a belief that the election was stolen, a litmus test for candidates that the party will support. So he's, he's felt, felt abandoned by friends and colleagues and certainly by the party that he was proud to be a part of for a long time. Yeah, and then part of what comes out in the book though too is that there is in a way a, uh, a civil war occurring within the Republican party itself between the folks who believe that the election wasn't stolen and those who do. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't undervalue that in a way because I think too often people conflate uh, you know, MAGA with the Republican Party, but when in, when in fact what you see is that there is a there is a movement, a radical, very radical, very extreme movement occurring, in part within the Republican Party, but then there are folks like Brad Raffensperger uh, and others in the party who are pushing back uh, strongly against it. So can you talk a little bit about the tensions that you found within the party itself um, that started uh, you know emerging in and around you know early November through January. Well, yeah, it happened in every one of the swing states. And, you know, as Matt has, has pointed out a number of times, the, uh, the people who are, who were sort of hands-on involved with the election, uh, they understand the machinery of American elections. They have confidence in the uh, uh, organizations that they've set up, the, the rules and regulations that they've put in place to conduct fair elections. And so they may be, you know, strong Republicans, they may be Trump supporters, but they also have personal integrity and they also have a certain amount of pride in, the, uh, in their own professionalism. So these are the people who, you know, in, in the chapters of our book are continually, you know, stepping up and refusing to lie, basically, and insisting that uh, in fact, the election results were true. But what they face is this uh, movement that Trump has created uh, by, um, you know, continually broadcasting this fiction that the election results weren't valid. And the one point that I keep stressing that I feel not enough people get or have made is how obvious it would be in this country if there were some massive fraud in our election results. We know the electoral, the election map in this country, right down to individual neighborhoods. This is why state legislatures can gerrymander districts to, to draw, you know, thin highways out to grab a neighborhood that's 
that they know is Republican or Democrat. So you may get, you know, fraud on a level where, you know, a handful of votes in this place or that place um, are falsified or that people, you know, are voting twice. That happens in every election. But if any major shift, certainly anything on the order of what Trump is alleging, which would be millions of votes, were suddenly falsified or shifted, it would be so obvious uh, that, you know, districts that were that have long longstanding Republican voting records suddenly went completely Democratic. That would be a red flag that everyone, everyone would notice. I mean, Matt mentioned Cheryl Guy in Michigan. There were a few thousand votes that she accidentally put in the wrong column. That set off a klaxon alarm all over the country. And you know, those private jets that were coming in were coming in because everybody noticed that that one little district in Michigan somehow went the wrong way. Well, how would that happen? Yeah, okay, let's talk a little bit more about whether or not you felt as if those pushing back um, in, within the Republican Party had appropriate support. And the, and the reason why I'm interested in that question is because as Hannah Arendt points out in her writings, as uh, Ziblatt and Levinsky do in How Democracies Die, the, the essential bulwark against authoritarianism in most societies, right-wing authoritarianism, right-wing populism, is not the left, but the center, the center right. That if you lose the center right, then you lose the essential, uh, you know, firewall or or Jersey barrier against the rise of authoritarianism within within uh, you know right leaning parties. In in other countries where they have multi party democracies, you can have um, you know an authoritarian or a right wing extremist populist party just take create its own party. And that becomes a faction within a parliament or a faction within the political scene. In our, you know, peculiar situation in America, where we only have two parties, um, the the maintenance of the center right and the strength that it has over the Republican Party seems to be essential uh, if we are to, you know, kind of keep uh, enough of a balance here. So the question is. Do you feel as if the folks who you were writing about who were doing the right thing had enough support, felt enough support, or did they feel like they were way out on a limb out there on their own? It's, some of that is still ongoing. So it's, we're in the middle of it um, and it'll become clearer in the next election or two. Um, but there are some things we can look back on. Like um, I think Georgia is an interesting case for this. Um, Brad Raffensperger, um, it, it was, you know, a re recorded and famous phone call um, in which Donald Trump called uh, Secretary of State in Georgia and told him to find 11,000 plus votes, just find the votes. Uh, Raffensperger stood up to him, said, no, I'm not going to do that. Your numbers are, are wrong. Uh, the, the count is accurate. Um, and it's a little discouraging that there was very little said in, in Raffensperger's uh, defense. A couple of Georgia officials uh, sort of meekly <laughs> stood up for him, but they've been run out of office now. Raffensperger himself is now facing a primary challenge from a Trump endorsed candidate for sec Secretary of State. Um, and so it doesn't appear that he's getting very much support and he, him being representative in this case of, of other officials around the country. That said, um, something kind of curious happened in Georgia, which was that you know, Trump lost by a little more than 11,000 votes. Um, but something that Raffensperger told me was that later they went back and looked at the ballots and realized that um, 28,000 people had just skipped voting for president, which is the reverse of the way it normally goes in a presidential election. People vote for the president. They've been seeing him on TV or whatever, and they skip the down ballot stuff because they don't really care and know who these guys are. But it was the reverse in this case, is that lots of people voted Republican, but skipped voting for the Republican candidate for president. They skipped Donald Trump. There were 28,000 of those. And assuming Trump won at least half of those, or less even, he would have won the state of Georgia. Um, so clearly there was some distaste among possibly moderate uh, Republicans in Georgia to where they yeah. just couldn't bring themselves to vote for Trump. So it's unclear well, I, stuff. 
I would strongly suggest to, to Morgan, um, who uh, wrote the check to you guys to write this book, that, that you continue reporting on this. Because uh, as, you, as you all know, a lot of the folks who were involved in the steel strategy are, are now running for office. Um, they are like, you know, Jody Heiss, who you just mentioned in Georgia running for Secretary of State. Heiss is up 20 points over Raffensperger. Uh, Mark Fincham in Arizona, who was very likely going to get the Republican nomination for Secretary of State of Arizona. Um, an a allied group of ours did a mini report a couple of days ago in which they said that in two thirds of the Secretary of State and governor's races up this year, uh, you have stopped the steel candidates running. So it's pervasive. And, and as you also might know, um, many of the Stop the Steel allies have already taken over some of the seats at the county level. Like there's a woman in Macomb County, Georgia, who the day after uh, Trump was defeated, said that, uh, that it, had all been, it had all been stolen, that Trump needed to declare a state of martial law and have military tribunals oversee the vote count moving forward. She's now uh, on the board of canvassers in Macomb County. So, which brings up my next question, which is um, that there is a, a pretty prevalent sense that a very strange domino effect could occur, could have occurred in any one of these states that could have led to a constitutional crack up or a constitutional crisis. Um, so for instance, had Wayne County in Michigan not certified or had the Michigan Board of Canvassers not certified. Uh, there were some believed the appropriate backup plans for certification and therefore for sending in the right slate of electors. But did you all find that or not? I mean, in the, in, when, from my reading of this and obviously from the work that we do at issue one and from the reviews, it seems like it was a lucky break in 2020. It was a lucky break that, that, a, that a crazy domino effect didn't occur. Um, what is your reporting show? My feeling is different, Nick. I really think that the center held in uh, 2020. I think that um, the American people were not, are not as dishonest or as cowardly as Donald Trump wanted them to be. These efforts failed in every state where they were tried. Every single lawsuit, including many heard before judges who were Republican, some of whom were appointed by Trump, every single lawsuit failed. Uh, I, I think that the, um, the truth is that elections in America would be very difficult to um, fake. I mean, the, the truth is that, you know, we don't run elections out of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. They're run in every neighborhood and every community across the country by your neighbors and my neighbors. And so even if you were to elect uh, someone who is sympathetic to the steel movement to a county or state position, they have to work alongside um, hundreds and thousands of, of other people who are in most cases volunteers or people who are being paid a pittance to do their civic duty. And I'm frankly, you know, maybe I'm naive, but I'm hoping that the principle that um, that the winner of the actual vote is the winner of the election uh, will, will prevail for most Americans. I do think that the real weakness that 2020 exposed was in this certification process. I think that Congress needs to do something to make sure that the actual winner of the vote is the person who gets the office. And the other thing that I would really think that almost everybody would agree with is that people who are volunteering to run our elections, who are doing the sometimes tedious and difficult job of actually making our elections work, should not be harassed into hiding or have their lives threatened without there being serious criminal penalties against those who would do things like that. So far as I know, not one person has been successfully prosecuted for this the level of harassment and threat that was leveled at election figures all over the country. Yep. Well, I, I want to look back to the question of certification in a bit, uh, but I, I, I first want to ask Matthew about um, uh, the role of social media in fueling these fires. The, the story that really struck me in the book was the guy in Georgia, the election worker in Georgia, 
who was overseeing one of these opener machines that opens the envelopes. And it opened an envelope and it kind of like got jammed. And so he pulled it out. And when he pulled it out, he realized that someone had actually put the instructions in addition to the ballot in the envelope, which is what jammed up the machine. So he pulled out the instructions, crumpled them up, threw them on the ground, and then gave, him, gave the instructions the finger because he had cut, like cut his hand or something or nicked his hand in the process and he was mad. A video of him was obtained um, and I'm not sure how it was obtained, but it was obtained and and was then grabbed by the steel crowd and went absolutely viral. The, the Trump sons started retweeting it. And I think within 12 hours or something, it had 5 million views. And the narrative about that moment was that this guy was crumpling up Trump ballots and throwing them away. So so can you talk a bit about the the role that social media plays in fueling these wildfires, these crazy fires. Yeah, the, the guy you're referring to is Lawrence Sloan, um, who, who came in, uh, worked for little or no money, just helping open envelopes, be part of the process. And the, he was treated, uh, for his trouble, he was treated to becoming uh, a, a, an internet villain uh, for some time. Um, and as you described, it was a completely innocent thing where he was just opening envelopes, but it was sort of contorted in the way that it was uh, shown online. Um, and it, he was at the front and end of something that I think may be with us for a long time, if not forever now, is that social media plays this outsized role. And, it, and it's so fast that Lawrence was sitting opening these envelopes. Um, and even as he was still sitting and opening the envelope, he was getting messages from people saying, hey, did you see this on Instagram? Did you see this on Twitter? It's got 5 million views on Twitter. And he's still that night doing the work. Um, he ended up uh, feeling sort of overwhelmed by this. He asked his supervisors if he could go out to the parking garage and just walk around a little bit. Uh, when he did, uh, sort of Trump cavalcade came in uh, and sort of steered toward him with these uh, trucks and vans with Trump flags and things. And he just lost his sense of what was real and what wasn't. And he took off running across the city of Atlanta. Um, and uh, he, he had death threats, his family was threatened. It was a, a, a difficult thing. And so this is something new, is that the scrutiny of the world a lot of this came from overseas as well. The scrutiny of the world can come to bear on individuals who are doing the most ground level work in American elections. And as Mark said, that there has to be a way to protect people from this. Um, I, I don't know uh, yet what that would be, um, but it, it's terrifying, certainly for people like that. And it's terrifying for all of us because our democracy depends on that work. I could tell you that there are some state laws that protect poll workers, but typically it's just the workers and not their families. There are no federal laws. Um, and and uh, so part of what's before Congress right now, as we shift to this kind of plan B moment, now that the Freedom to Vote Act has failed in the Senate, is a discussion in the Senate, a bipartisan discussion around a number of things, one of which, which is poll worker protection. Um, mm -hmm. There's also a meaningful discussion occurring inside the Department of Justice about how they can ramp up their poll worker protection efforts too, because they have some role to play. Um, but it's you know so far been at DOJ, they've never really focused heavily on this. And I think that they realize that they need to do more of that now. Just going back to uh, Mark, to you for a second, and then uh, folks, if you wanna start populating some questions in the q and I think Jamila is going to gonna pluck out some questions for the authors on the, the, the certification process, Mark. You know, every organism, um, if it is to survive, it learns lessons and it evolves and it gets stronger and better. Uh, and the same is true of vibrant political movements. If they're gonna survive and evolve and have the effect that they want, they learn and they adapt. Um, a lot of folks would argue that they, that we all got lucky because yes, the courts held 60 plus court cases in 2020 and none of them even taken up by a judge because there was a lack of evidence. And yes, Aaron von Langenfeld on the Michigan Board of Canvassers and others in Raffensburger did the right thing. But what happens, what happens 
if those people aren't there anymore? What happens if Jody Heiss is the Secretary of State in Georgia? What happens, as it is already the case, if you have you know, members of the steel movement uh, now in the position to either certify or not, uh, and either gum up things at the county level or not, because part of part of the ban and strategy, as he is, has projected it on his own podcast, this this precinct strategy he calls it, is that they're going to populate election administration from the very gra- grassroots level all the way up, and um, he says that they're going to do it so that they can ensure integrity in the election. But the the <laughs> the alternative plan is that what you do is you create a failure of certification across the swing states, which draws the results into, conclu- into question and therefore leaves it to the state legislatures, all of which, as you all know, in the swing states, all those state legislatures are Republican dominated in both chambers. It would naturally leave it to the legislatures to decide the results. Um, so, so Mark, um, you know, in terms of kind of what this could look like in 2024, if some of the current, the, the trends that we see occurring right now continue, um, do you think that we are potentially at, at greater risk? Certainly, potentially we are. And, you know, that theory, uh, which Trump t- tried to put in practice in 2020, um, could conceivably uh, take election results and cast them aside and basically have slates of electors chosen um, for partisan reasons. You know, I'm skeptical that that could happen, but that doesn't mean I'm right, that, you know, that it couldn't. My feeling is, though, that so many people would have to be involved, certainly from uh, at the level of actually counting the votes accurately. And the systems that we have in place to collect votes are so redundant. I mean, there's digital records, there's paper trails for all those digital records. They tried to do this recount out in Arizona where I think they clearly set out to try and show that the election results were wrong and they found in fact they were correct and they undercounted Biden. So, I mean, I don't think you can mess uh, with the actual vote count. So the next level is the certification. And I, again, you know, while you may put Trump supporters or stop the steel supporters or you know, extreme partisans in some of these positions, um, It would take a lot of them, I think, to override such a basic principle. I mean, it's never even been open for question in this country that state legislatures can decide to certify um, a candidate, you know, who who lost the election in their state. I don't know of that ever happening. And, you know, I, there's a lot of, there was a lot of enthusiasm for Trump. There are a lot of people who are going to run for these offices because there's a wave that they can ride in order to get into that position. But once they're in that position, it would be a fairly extreme and dramatic thing to decide you aren't going to accept what the American people have, have cast their votes to elect. You know, I hope I'm right about that, but, you know, and I could certainly be wrong. The risk is greater because of the, this movement. And I think it should be resisted uh, with every, you know, every way that we can. But I, I think it would take uh, a lot more than what Steve Bannon uh, has in his uh, fever dreams to to make that happen. Great. So Jamila, do you want to uh, start fielding some questions from the from the audience? Absolutely. Um, we have a few good ones. Um, so the first question is: Is there an organized group pushing back against the stop the, stop the steal extremists running for office right now? Well, that's that. I suppose I should take that one, um, unless you guys report on that. Uh, the answer is the answer is yes. Um, there are groups like ours and many others who are who are working on coordinated strategies to push back in in various ways. Um, but I want to save that more for the end um, because that's not something that the the authors can necessarily field or be involved in. Um. The next question is, what do you think is going to happen to the Republican Party going forward, given all uh, the division? Well, my fondest hope uh, is that the Republican Party, which has sort of been captive to this uh, Donald Trump stop the steal segment, will self-destruct if they don't, um, you know, return to reality. 
I, I, I would forecast that you're going to see divisions in the Republican ranks all across the country. And if they don't sort that out um, before the next election, I think they're gonna really get hurt. No, Jimmy, Jimmy. Matt, Matt, do you have anything to add? Oh, uh, no, I, I, I get nervous about forecasting, uh, but I think you can already see some of the fissures um, forming right now. Donald Trump has a, an iron grip on a portion of the Republican Party, um, but not every uh, conservative person is beholden even to the party. Um, so it's, it's a difficult time for the GOP, and I, I really couldn't predict what's going to happen. Um, let's see. So the next question is, um, if Mike Pence had the right to overrule the uh, 2020 election, do you feel like Kamala Harris would uh, have the right to overrule the 2024 election? Absolutely. <laughs> One of the things that a lot of these folks, you know, don't seem to realize is that these methods cut both ways. Uh, so, I mean, what you, you're not going to ensure Trumpian rule forever if you can insert, you know, election officials who are willing to stack the election in his favor. What you're going to ensure is a um, dishonest election system where whoever has the most power will dictate, you know, who the next candidate is. And the way politics have always gone in this country is that the the, uh, you know, the scale tips both ways. All right, uh, one more. Um, why are the Republicans totally unre unwilling to pass any legislation to protect voting rights and roll back um, voter suppression efforts? Well, I so I can, I can, I can, yeah, I can take please. this one. Sure. Please. So, so in in um, listen right now that it, what it comes down to is is uh, the the big show is obviously in Congress, and the Freedom to Vote Act um, did recently fail, but we're seeing positive signs, and we should all be supportive of those positive signs in the Senate. So what we see right now is we see um, that Senator Collins has been able to recruit at least eight, perhaps more, of her fellow Republicans to form subgroups along with Democrats in the Senate, and those subgroups are taking on the Electoral Count Act, which deals with the certification process and the role of the vice president, some other things that we just talked about, uh, voting rights, uh, election worker protections, and then other kind of related stuff around ballot security, cyber security, paper trails, you know, other election protection stuff. Um, whether or not that all comes together into one big voting rights and election package, they could be passed in a bipartisan fashion through Congress or whether it, the, each one of those different ideas or areas takes shape into its own piece of legislation, we don't yet know. But I can tell you that we at Issue One are extremely involved with Senate staff and senators themselves in, in helping drive this forward at this point. So, you know, we're certainly hopeful that um, we'll see major significant uh, upgrading or updating of the Electoral Count Act and uh, in addition to that, we were seeing positive signs around election protection me measures, some voting rights measures, including the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and some other stuff. Yeah, if I can add to that, Nick, you know, it, it, the, the issues around um, changes that, would, that make it easier for people to vote uh, so that more people vote and those who would prefer not to have those measures in place are, are very political. And they've always been very political, at least in modern times. You know, the Republican Party has um, resisted efforts to broaden uh, the voting base and Democrats have pushed really hard to make it as easy as possible for, for people to vote. And I think that, you know, that, that has clear political consequences. And so it's not at all surprising that those things become, uh, the, you know, fierce partisan battles, uh, gerrymandering the same thing. But, you know, this, these issues of whether um, uh, the vote that, that's actually cast is the one that ought to be certified or that election workers should be able to do this civic duty without being harassed. These are things that I would think 
just about every American could agree with. So, you know, I think that that's probably a more fruitful path for Congress going forward. Jamil, let me ask this question that I think my dad, it looks like a family affair all of a sudden here, that I think my dad typed into the, the Q&A. Um, uh, in your research, did you find the evangelical right involved or was it just the, a cadre of people like Giuliani, uh, Sidney Powell, Bannon, et cetera? Did you see any kind of actual, you know, organizing within the evangelical right? I, I, I'll, I'll take this one, um, is that I would say that the organization of the evangelical uh, vote uh, happened earlier. Uh, that, you know, that was part of persuading people to vote a certain way. Um, but that once the election happened, um, I don't think that they were particularly useful anymore to Giuliani and company. Um, and so it became a more just a political uh device that, that carried on. So the answer is no, I, I didn't see any evangelical involvement in, in any of that. I can, I can tell you that Bill Haslam, who is the former Republican governor of Tennessee, wrote a piece in the Atlantic, um, I believe back in October, in which he's, he's also an evangelical, in which he said that he was very concerned about the rise of the QAnon movement within um, churches throughout the country, evangelical churches throughout the country and throughout the South mainly is what he was talking about. And not only that, but he said that um, some of the pastors that he's spoken with say that the QAnon folks have started finding pieces of scripture that they believe somehow fits their conspiracy theory and they're so they're trying to organize the churches, especially the mega churches in the South as recruitment vehicles for QAnon. Um, by linking up Q theories with biblical text. Um, and that was, that's, that's a Republican governor who's, who's an evangelical who was kind of ringing the alarm bell in the Atlantic about it. So something's probably afoot, um, whether or not it had an effect in 2020, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't seem like it. Jamila, any more questions? Yes, one more came in. Um, how much of what is going on can be attributed to Trump and how much can be attributed to uh, his disciples or friends? If Trump fades away, how much of this, um, of what we are seeing will persist? A huge deal of the responsibility, I think we can lay to Trump. I mean, he is uh, someone who leads a very large movement in this country. And as we've said, he's the only president in American history who refused to concede that he lost an election and who has fed this suspicion based upon disappointment uh, of his loss uh, among his followers that he was robbed uh, of the presidency. So he gets a huge amount of credit for it. But I think, you know, these kinds of uh, uh, anti-democratic movements exist in a free society and always have. And social media amplifies everything from the bizarre theories of QAnon to, uh, you know, a belief that uh, the, the Russians, you know, or the Venezuelans uh, changed the programming of, of voting machines. I mean, people are inclined to believe what they read and if they, what they want to believe. And I think, you know, social media is a, is a much bigger problem uh, in our country and around the world uh, than, it's much bigger than the, the results of any one election or American electoral results. I think it's, it's been a really damaging thing to just about every institution in our society. I personally, I, I think Donald Trump didn't create um, himself. I, I think he was thrust uh, into that position by uh, disaffected factions of the electorate. Um, and so I think until we better understand some of those things, uh, there will always be some new person pushed to the fore uh, to take over that position. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe once he's gone, it'll all go away. Um, but I, I don't think so. Hey, Morgan, you're, you're a publisher. Um, uh, now, you're obviously a book publisher and, and the platforms try to pretend like they're not publishers, that they're just cork boards and that they're, you know, people can put whatever they want on them. Do you think that the platform should be forced, Morgan, to play 
a strong a stronger role in taking down um, some of these falsehoods about the election. I mean that that the example on Twitter of the five million video views of the guy and you know the worker in Georgia who who crumpled up allegedly the Trump ballot, but it wasn't that at all. That's a great example of something that if Twitter were to throw a team of a couple thousand people, which is, would be cheap for them, um, on this more aggressively, they could have taken that down. You know, um, they could have right. confirmed it and then taken it down quickly, you know, so that it wouldn't have spread so far. Well, I, I think, I mean, this is a, a, a huge, you put your finger right on it. I mean, we in 96 decided that they were going to be like telephone companies. To, you were, they were just the wires and the conversations going through them. They had no responsibility. I have to take responsibility for everything that I put out uh, in print, in a book or in an ebook. And uh, they've done tremendous, this has done tremendous damage to, to many aspects of our society. I mean, you watch the Spotify uh, 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 COVID thing with Joe Reagan lately, it's on and on every day, every week on different issues. And so, yeah, we have, we have um, damaged um, discourse at a level that I've never seen. And the fact that you can have hundreds and thousands of office holders going out with a completely false narrative with no evidence behind it and not much pushback at all is disturbing. And, um, you know, these, these platforms have gotten us where we are. And, they, and I, I hope, I'm not sure it'll ever happen because now that horse left the barn decades ago and they are so powerful uh, and there's so much money at stake. I think that's another thing that in this conversation hasn't come up is that everyone's making money off of this, right? I mean, we have estimated what guys between uh, uh, 250 and $500 million minimum has been raised off this false narrative and continues to be raised and started to be raised before the election happened. Um, so, you know, people are getting paid. The uh, digital monopolies are making money off of the engagement. We saw, see, saw that Facebook whistleblower saying that they were, you know, amplifying the extreme uh, because it made them more money. They get more eyeballs. They get more engagement. And so, yes, do I believe they should be held responsible? I do. And I believe that it's, it, it, if we could get that to happen, it would rectify a lot of problems that we've got over a wide range of issues. But I'm not sure that that's going to be possible. But um, you know, you wish that they had a little bit more sense of social responsibility. Indeed. By the way, I want to thank uh, Whitney Hatch, our board chair, for connecting us with Morgan, who I, I think you guys roomed together in college. Is that right? I, I don't think yeah. we roomed. Whitney had a single. He was oh. special. <laughs> but we were, in, we were in college together uh, in the medieval times, you know, <laughs> right, exactly. California in the 70s. Right. Um, one of the other questions I want to pull from the Q&A, and then I want to give you a little bit of a sense of, of issue one moving forward. Um, is this question about um, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party failing to kind of bridge the gap between progressives and disaffected white working class voters, which is in part why the, the you know the Democratic Party has has lost a lot of those voters over the years. In your reporting, did you all see? Um, did you all have? I know this isn't what you write about, but did you guys see any um, get any greater insight into? the the gap between the democratic party and those some of those disaffected white working class voters who you report on in the book no i really didn't uh, you know what, what i saw and I, matt can answer for himself in the reporting that we did <clears throat> was that the um movement to stop the steal came primarily through social media uh, it came through people who have been radicalized by their Facebook pages or whatever platforms that they uh, agree in and or QAnon or these other, you know, phenomena on, on the internet. And, and they were, as you might expect, highly disorganized. Um, you know, the, the efforts, even the legal efforts in the six swing states were not being coordinated by serious attorneys for the most part who had bailed on on Trump's case fairly early on. These were sort of local volunteers who were either looking for uh, attention or who, you know, perhaps really had fallen for some of the stories that they were pushing into court. So no, I didn't see any um, deeper social or political um, ramifications of, of what was going on. I, I didn't see like union people, you know, endorsing one side or, or the other. 
Well, great. So let me let me just tell you all um, assembled here about our plans moving forward at issue one, and then we can wrap up. So we've got a three point plan uh, to extend our counter revote campaign, as I said, through January of 2025. The first is a communications plan um, to create what we call the big truth. Uh, the you know the stop the steel crowd has their big lie. It's their narrative. It's compelling for them, and they spread it far and wide. But what is what's the what's the truth? What's the common narrative that we all um, who believe in election integrity and believe in the results, what, what's that story? What's the story that we tell each other and how can we tell it better to bind each other together into a movement um, on behalf of election integrity and the truth? We're gonna be working with a number of communications firms and doing a bunch of testing um, and deep dives to come up with that and to come up with it in a way that everyone from Coca-Cola to pastors to heads of universities to heads of unions to you name it can embrace it. Um, we need a counter narrative. Um, we can't just have kind of fact checking on the other side. The second piece on the communications front is to reach directly out to persuadable Republican voters in the swing states and to help uh, migrate them into the kind of pro integrity camp. Um, if there is going to be an attempt to subvert the election in 2024, it's more likely to occur if there seems to be unanimity within the Republican parties in those swing states to the extent that we can create greater dissension in the Republican parties in those swing states, it's less likely that, that um, profound subversion attempts can occur. So we'll be reaching out to those Republican leaning voters in part through our council on election integrity and many of our Republican members, but also through some of the, the 200 former members of Congress that we've recruited at issue one to help us with this work, half of whom are Republican. Um, Part two of our plan is legislative. And as I said, there's a big push right now in the Senate. It's real, it's genuine, it should be taken seriously. Um, there are nine named Republican senators involved and I can name a bunch who are gimme votes. They're, they, they will vote for stuff like Rubio and Toomey from Pennsylvania and um, probably Scott from North Carolina and some others who aren't kind of in the list of folks who are working, but we believe that there are enough out there to get us to 60 or more on some of these election protection measures, including uh, amending the Electoral Count Act. So that's gonna be feverish work that's gonna occur in the next four to five months. And we're looking for all the support and help we can get in it. And then finally, um, we've got a two-part plan around poll workers moving forward. One is to do the very thing that they do in this fantastic book and elevate these everyday heroes. Uh, we call it, we're calling it the Faces of Democracy campaign, and we're going to recruit both current and retired election workers. We're going to tell their stories in video and on, on our website, and then we're going to media train them and put a media firm behind them to push them out into the media, including into right of center media like Fox News, so that, so that Americans realize that not only do every day people run our democracy, but that they're your neighbors. And, and by the way, they're Republicans, they're Democrats and independents, and you can relate to them. So what's the point of doing that? The point is, is twofold. Number one, we need to humanize democracy in this country. It too often seems like almost an academic concept. The more that people can see that this is that's like democracy is us, democracy is run by every one of us, um, the more they can relate to it. Number two, we got to bring down the heat on these people, as, as Mark and, 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 and Matthew have chronicled in their book. We got to bring down the heat, and the only way to bring down the heat is to is to make sure that people can really relate to them and see them as fellow human beings. And then the second piece of the poll worker plan is to um, is to create a clarion call to recruit more people to volunteer and run um, for poll worker offices around the country. The Steel crowd is doing this all the time, and again, they're winning seats. Good people need to be doing the opposite, basically, which is running for the sake of making sure that the steel crowd can't take over these seats and these positions. Um, so we're gonna be doing a, a big effort around that. And we're of course gonna be um, shining a bright, bright spotlight on members of the steel crowd that are both running and that have already taken over these positions to make sure that people are very aware of who they are and what they think to expose them. Um, so if, in, unless I know, Matthew, you've got to run. Mark, unless you, Matthew, or Morgan have any final thoughts, we can wrap up. No, Thank I'm you good for having Thank you for inviting us, Nick. Yeah. Thanks very I much. I just want to um, 
tell everyone that's still with us to uh, that they can buy the book and the link for um, politics and prose is in the chat. Great, thank you. Politics and prose is a great independent bookstore. So uh, <laughs> support your indies. <laughs> All right, Bye, thank folks. you guys. Thanks, Nick. The book. Thanks for thank coming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.